I had a seminar a few years ago, in, uh, went, went for about two or three years, where we thought about this question very carefully. And uh, the students in the seminar went out and talked with people who described themselves as spiritual but not religious. What do you mean by that? Of course, they got a variety of different responses. But uh, we boiled them down to three descriptions of this constituency. Now, I, I mention this because I think this constituency, the spiritual but not religious people, although they're severely criticized by a lot of ministers and priests and speak so wishy-washy and not knowing what they're doing and why don't they serve, uh, I think it's a very important, uh, what should I say, audience, very important uh, public uh, for the churches, including Pentecostal churches, to reach. So here's what we discovered about these students, about how they, these were mainly students and young people, not all students. Uh, and I have it uh, in, in three uh, S's. Uh, they are searching, suspicious, and selective. You can see by now that I like sort of uh, alliterative things. D this, D that, now th three S's. It's, it gets an aid memoir. <laughs> searching. They, one, of the, one, one, one respondent put it very, very helpfully. He said, look, we're in the search mode. If you go to Amazon.com to buy a, a book, first you go into search mode, you look through and you look at all the various books, and then if there's one that you might want to buy, you push a button that says, place in basket. Well, this guy said, yeah, we're in search mode, we're not ready yet to put it in the basket. We're in search mode. We're searching. <coughs> Press a little further. What are you searching for? Just what are you looking for? And again, they, they, hardly any of these people who were, that we talked to were, wanted to be called atheists. Absolutely, we're not atheists. I'm not an atheist, no. I'm spiritual. Not religious, I'm not an atheist. They rejected that. But one of them said, you know the old Peggy Lee song? I don't know how they knew that because it was way back in my time. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Got a lot of things. We got, you know, you, you, you have food on the table, you have education, you have loving parents. You have, but there's some sense that there's something else that's missing. Is that all there is, a, a yearning, a, 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 a sense that there is a mystery, a transcendence. But you don't like the way <coughs> transcendence and mystery, spiritual mystery, is being packaged and delivered by institutional churches today. That's the nub of it. Don't like the structure through which it, it comes to us. How can you separate what they take to be kind of a misuse of power, and I think they're often right, by the custodians of the spiritual, so you can get at the spiritual reality? Is that all there is? Uh, that's the searching <coughs> part, searching. Second is suspicious. These uh, people were all r suspicious as I just said, of the link between spirituality and institutional power. It doesn't seem to be right somehow. It, doesn't, it just seemed not to be right to them. Uh, and also, uh, they were deeply suspicious of what they called the my way or the highway, uh, the exclusivism of a lot of the Christian churches that they knew about. We're right, you're wrong, do it our way or you're, uh, you're out. They, they suspected that this, is, this can't be right. Uh, uh, I have friends, I have colleagues, I have parents, I have relatives who are, uh, who are some of them are, 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 are Christians, some of them are not, but they're leading lives that I find exemplary. How can we exclude them on this, in this sort of my way or the highway business? Um, they were also very suspicious of um, uh, of the uh, imposed moralism 
of the, uh, what they took to be the religious institution. They know that life is more complicated than the simple rules often imposed by churches. And they certainly were very suspicious of creeds and uh, uh, emphasized that I have to experience this in my life rather than being told uh, what I have to believe in order to be a part of this. And finally, they're very selective. Uh, one of my students called them collage builders. <laughs> and what a collage is, you take a piece from here and a piece from there, and put it together and build a collage. That's a common phenomenon now. Uh, you don't simply buy a whole tradition the Presbyterian tradition, or the Pentecostal, or even the Catholic tradition, you're, uh, you're selective. Uh, you pick out something here, something there. Now that sounds incoherent, maybe chaotic, to many of us who, uh, who are uh, theologically trained and we're, uh, we're, we're related to one of these traditions, but that's the fact of life. And if you look carefully at your own faith, I'll bet you'll find a little selectivity there, too. Uh, uh, you go to church, you hear a sermon, uh, and you say, well, yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know about that. There is a kind of, um, uh, of, a, of an independence, which didn't used to be the case centuries ago. You bought the package. That was it. Uh, no more. Now, uh, you know, I'm not advocating necessarily all these attitudes. I think there's some very shaky things about them. I'm describing a reality, a spiritual reality, to which our churches have to respond one way or another. And one way to do it is to open up so that people who have these questions, these suspicions, but this hunger, is that all there is? Have a place to come and be accepted and, and be, uh, be heard and talk with each other and hear the story of Jesus, which in this, in this setting has a lot of attraction. Has a lot of attraction uh, to people in this search mode. Okay, searching, suspicious, and uh, selective. Okay, I'm, I'm getting toward the end here, uh, Maria, but I do want to say something, uh, a, a few words at least, about this uh, grim prospect that we face Will there be a Christianity in the future? Will there be a world in the future? And I want to do this by, by saying a word or two about what I've come to believe is the single most, the single gravest threat to our future as a planet and as a species, and that is uh, the uh, change in climate, climate change. Not just, it's not global warming. It's, a, it's, it's the, a, a change in the, in the climate of the entire planet which is galloping. It's not, it's not uh, changing slowly or, or gradually. It is galloping. And I would like to sum this up with three, three numbers that Bill McKibben, who's one of the great prophets of the, of the uh, uh, of, uh, critique of global, uh, of global climate change, calls the three scary numbers. <laughs> and these, I, when I first read them, these are scary. First is uh, two degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the top limit in the warming of the globe that we can go through without an utterly catastrophic uh, uh, ending to it all. Because some of this is feedback. The polar ice melts, and when it melts, more water is exposed to the, uh, to the sun, and it is, instead of being reflected back as the ice did, does, it's absorbed into the, into the earth and more ice melts. And there's a certain point where you simply can't turn that off and go back. This is a process which is, uh, uh, is, is not reversible. Now, 167 countries agreed this is the top limit. They negotiated that figure. It's 3.6 3 degrees Fahrenheit. We can't go beyond that, or it's catastrophic. But no, this was at the Oslo conference, I think, no, Copenhagen conference, but they didn't agree on how to stop it. They all agreed it ought to be slowed down or stopped. What to do with it? They, didn't, they have not agreed, and still haven't. 
agreed. Second big number, second scary number, is 565 gigatons. A gigaton is 1,000 million tons. Now, this is the budget. This is the number of tons of carbon dioxide which can be released into the air before this catastrophe occurs. 565 gigatons. The problem is that we are already releasing about 32 gigatons a year. That was 2011, which means that in 16 years, we will have reached the 565 gigatons in 16 years. That's a scary number. Now, the third and perhaps the most scary number is 2,795, also gigatons. That's the amount of coal and gas and oil that are still in the earth, which are being removed from the earth and pumped into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide at an increasing, an increasing rate every year, uh, and moving us more and more toward this catastrophic end, end number. Uh, and which then, when we hit that number, I'm saying when here, because it looks now it's going to be when, not if, we'll see rising sea levels more than has ever been witnessed in human history. We'll see, uh, we'll see the species instinct extinctions speeding up. We'll see gyrations in weather, huge dr uh, droughts, and then huge storms, and then really hot, and then too cold. Uh, not uh, global warming, but gyrations, unpredictable gyrations, worse and worse. Uh, super storms. Uh, Whole areas will disappear under the water, and there will especially be areas in which poor people live. Crops will not be able to be grown. There will be millions and millions of people trying to get out of those areas and moving into the more prosperous countries. You think we have a migration issue now. Imagine what it's going to be like when this happens. And then what one observer says, heat waves from hell. Really, really warming. Now, if you look at this figure of all uh, the, the, uh, the figure of uh, 2,795 gigatons left in the Earth, which shouldn't be, all of, all of it shouldn't be taken out, 80% of it has to be left in the ground to avoid hitting this, this catastrophic figure, 80%. However, the big energy corporations, including Exxon and the others, have already made their plans for extracting this, uh, these uh, elements and transferring them into, uh, uh, transforming them into CO2. Those plans are in the books. And someone has estimated that to, uh, to leave enough in the earth so that we don't hit the catast catastrophe button would, would, re it would require these corporations to lose about $20 trillion. And they're not quite prepared at this point to write off $20 trillion. Now, that's all, I'm sorry, folks, that's all very uh, grim news, but, uh, but it's, I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we're aware, as aware as we should be of, the, uh, of what's happening. And as one of the, one of the scientists uh, says, look, we're not talking about this will probably lead to a catastrophe. It is for sure. It's for sure. Now, some of this I get from my son-in-law, Peter Kellerman, who's a professor of earth science at Columbia University and one of the leading experts in uh, climate change. OK, so let me, <laughs> let me go on to uh, my very last and very short point. And this has to do with God's sense of humor. Um, you can see I don't have too many uh, pieces left here. Uh, if, you, if you ever read Dante's Inferno in, in Italian, which you ought to, even if you don't understand Italian, you should, it's a beautiful language. When he has, um, when Dante is about to reach heaven, he's gone through the Inferno, he's gone through Limbo, he's gone through Purgatory, he's about to get to heaven, and he says in Italian, 
Me samble el riso del universo. He was listening. It sounded to me like the laughter of the universe. The laughter of the universe. Well, maybe it was God's laughter, because I do think that, John, that uh, Francis is, a, uh, is good news, something that ought to uh, cheer us all up. Look at what he did. He became pope. Three days later, he made a trip down to the little island of Lampedusa in the Mediterranean and greeted, welcomed, hungry, destitute refugees from Africa who were trying to get over into Europe and turned around and spoke to his European colleagues and said, we should welcome the strangers and not, not reject them. He, uh, he then uh, uh, made, made a, a talk right away saying, our first concern in the Christian church ought to be for unemployed youth and lonely old people. These are the concerns I think that a Center for the Study of Pentecostalism has to uh, address. And since this is a launching, I want to end, this really is the end, by the way. Uh, I want to end with a prayer that, uh, f that might be used at the launching of a ship. You know, a launching is usually a launching of a ship. And you take a bottle of champagne and you whack it on the back of the ship and the ship is launched. So here, here is a prayer for the study, Center for the Study of Global Pentecostalism. Number one, well, I don't have to number prayers, do you? Just go ahead. <laughs> May her captains be courageous and skilled and foresighted. May her crew carry the precious cargo of the full gospel to all parts of the world. May the rains that fall upon her, this is the ship of the Center for the Study, the rains that fall upon her be showers of blessing. May the wind that buffets her be the breath of the Spirit. We pray in the name of the captain of captains, Jesus Christ. Amen. Got it on? Okay. I wondered if someone was trying to keep me from speaking. Um, I would like us to uh, take a few moments to um, uh, ask some questions to Dr. Cox uh, for this uh, very interesting and um, insightful lecture. Uh, we have two microphones, one on each side. So um, as I'm speaking, if you have a question, please make your way to one of the microphones and, um, and ask your question. We have one coming already. Dr. Kuntz, what a great joy to have you here at Southeastern University. Thank you very much. If you'll forgive me, I actually uh, typed here in my notes a question I'd like to ask, and I wanted to be sure that I stated it precisely as in a specific way, if you, so if you'll bear with me. Um, having ministered overseas in the former Soviet Union among Russian people, I have great familiarity with the Orthodox Church, so I'd like to ask this question in relation to your point regarding the decretalization of the church. Um, as you know, the Orthodox Church refers to itself as the Church of the Seven Councils, and as such, considers itself the true, unchanging, original church, which prides itself in its experiential orientation to the work of the Holy Spirit, something that, as Pentecostals, we also mm -hmm. uh, emphasize. In your estimation, is the Orthodox Church the true unchanging original church or merely a product of imperialistic Constantinian manipulation <laughs> of the primitive church born on the day of Pentecost that we read about in the Bible? Do I have to choose between those two options? <laughs> uh, let's hope that it's somewhere in between. Uh, I think it's, it's an important corrective, however, to know that the Councils. I was very severe on, on the Council of Nicaea. I admit that. Uh, uh, I, I think it was a 
bad move, but there was a history of several councils, and they're part of our history, all of us as Christians. Whether we like them or not, they're part of our history, and we don't have to subscribe to the letter, to those creeds, but we have to realize that people were trying to formulate something at the time. Now, the Orthodox Church has done pretty well at preserving at least symbolically, symbolically, their history with the creeds, and also this emphasis on the experience of the, of the spirit. They've, they've done both. My impression, you would know this much better, is that vast, vast numbers of people in Russia consider themselves orthodox, but are not churchgoers, and don't subscribe to hardly any uh, of the, uh, unless you, they don't even know what the, what the orthodox church teaches. Orthodox for them generally means I'm Russian. <laughs> and, Russia, and Orthodoxy is the, is the uh, religion of, of, of this nation. Uh, who was it that told me today somebody, uh, in, uh, I, uh, who was that? Uh, I met one of the first people in the faculty who said he'd met somebody there who introduced himself in Russia, who introduced himself as an Orthodox atheist. That was, for, that was you, okay. <laughs> That was, in, that was in Belarus, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So go figure. You? Uh, Dr. Cox, um, my question deal has to do with normativity of theology. So um, your descriptions of what's going on uh, with global Pentecostalism and where people are going with uh, the pl uh, a plurality of theology, uh, um, a move away from creedalism and whatnot, now, I see that as a very descriptive uh, um, description of what's going on. Now, moving on to normativity, are we then now relegated to almost like almost a quaint uh, culturalist linguistic post-liberalism in which, yeah, we can have some dialogue, but are we now, our, our theology is now relegated to almost a tribe, a, a large tribe, um, so that you may have, you know, uh, 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 oneness Pentecostals in Pentecostalism, that's all good, Trinitarian Pentecostalism, and then maybe uh, now we can bring in Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and say those are authentic expressions of Christianity. And then, and I feel like as, if we bring in the question of normativity, we lose, the, uh, uh, if we continue this route, we lose, we seem to lose um, a point of critique. And as, as a, uh, as as someone who's interested in theology, I've already mm -hmm. seen a lot of people critique um, a Greek influence in Christianity. But if we are relegated to a cultural linguistic model, then isn't a Greek Christianity just that cultural linguistic expression of their authentic Christianity? What do we do about the question of normativity in, mm -hmm. in pluralistic Christianity? Boy, that's an awfully good question. Uh, and I, I'm afraid my response is not going to be as uh, 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 very art articulate or, or plausible. Uh, I, I meant it when I said that we're moving into a period now in which that transition from a Palestinian movement into the Greco-Roman culture and, and the history of creedalism, that was, that was a difficult transition for Christianity to make. But it's utterly simple compared to the transition we're making now into a Chinese expression of Christianity or a real Indian expression from the, uh, in South India. Uh, multiple, multiple theologies. And surely we, the normativity has to arise from a dialogue among these different, uh, these different culturally anchored uh, theologies, if you will. I think that's a very exciting enterprise. And, uh, and it's, it's, it is already happening. And it's, uh, and of course, the other part of it is that all of these uh, uh, newly emergent theological formulations of various places in the world have the experiential element as central. We understand and experience this gospel in a way in, in influenced by our cultural history and by who we are and where we stand in the world. Uh, so I. Uh, I hope you really continue to be a theologian. Don't give up on it. Uh, and, and welcome the fact that your agenda now, as you start working theologically for the next years, is going to be one of the most exciting and challenging uh, in, in hundreds of years. 
But please do find ways to get to know these emerging new theologies around the world. This is something that I think we can contribute here in the Center for uh, Study of Global Pentecostalism. Uh, get to know them and, and make sure that the conversation continues and we don't impose what was our Greco-Roman uh, European model on other people. I, I, I think you would agree. We, we simply can't or shouldn't be doing that. Although they have to take it just as seriously as we take their history and, and talk back and forth and see where that, where that leads us. But uh, please, please go ahead and be a theologian. It's a great life. <laughs> it doesn't pay that much, but it's, it gets, it's, a, it's a good life. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cox, you said you see women assuming a wider role in leadership. I wonder if you'd expound a little bit on, about that. How do you see that happening? Mm. Uh, especially considering that in the, many of the emerging populations, women have uh, a more secondary role. So mm -hmm. if you could just give a little bit more insight on that, we'd, I'd appreciate that. Well, you know, if you're, certainly if you're a woman, uh, it's, it's still a pretty discouraging picture. But look, I'm old enough to remember when there weren't any women Anglican priests. None. Zilch. Now we have women Anglican priests and bishops. Uh, there weren't any women rabbis for, for thousands of years. We now have women teaching Torah in the synagogue to young, young Jewish girls who see them. There's a woman there, and she's opening the holy book. Now, that's, that's, that's going to continue. It's going to, now, admittedly, it's pretty, it's pretty slow going. And one of the discouraging things is, you're right, that some of the newly emergent churches are, are stuck in a, in a uh, let's say, a patriarchal mode. Maybe not stuck, but they're... Now, here, however, I, I think there's absolutely no excuse for Pentecostals. Given the, uh, the textual basis of Pentecostalism, especially in the Book of Acts, and in the history of Pentecostalism in this country, there's no excuse for excluding women from leadership. It's just ridiculous. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, for heaven's sake. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the women apostles that Paul names and thanks for working with them, and the history of women in the, in the Pentecostal movement in this country, uh, including Amy Semple McPherson and a whole bunch of others, on what possible basis now uh, uh, can, can... Now, I know there's, there's a certain kind of, of uh, uh, may I call it fundamentalist, reading of two or three passages from Paul, which but biblical scholars aren't all sure that he actually wrote them. Uh, excluding women, women be silent in your churches and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, is that going to be the only criterion? I was with, uh, tw 15 years ago, I was with a group of Pentecostal women pastors in, in South America. Uh, they were gathered from all over the continent. I think it was, in, it was in Mexico. And for some reason, I was allowed to listen in from the back row. And they were struggling with St. Paul. You know, what he said, be silent in your churches. And I thought, now, how are they going to do this? Are they going to take a critical biblical historical view and say, well, maybe this is a marginal insert? Or are they, what, or are they going to do, how are they going to deal with this? I think that was then. And they said, look, St. Paul could not possibly have meant that we couldn't be pastors of, of, of churches because, look, here we are. <laughs> and they're hundred. Couldn't have meant that. So, so uh, you know, it may sound simple, but that's the evidence, I think, that the spirit continues to lead the churches, continues to correct us, continues to bring forth new life. And I think certainly one of those new forms of new life is the leadership of women. I had one of the first women, when I first couple came to Harvard Divinity School, uh, a, a Jewish woman who wanted to be a rabbi. Unheard of at the time. <laughs> Uh, her, 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 her name is uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn uh, Redgrave. And she became a rabbi. 
and was one of the first ordained in the, she was in the Reformed uh, tradition. But now there are, there are women rabbis in the Reformed and conservative, and they'll, they'll probably be eventually Orthodox women rabbis, although that will take a while. Now that's a, that's a reversal of a very long trend, going back three or 4,000 years. Now I know, Peg, it's not going fast enough, and we all like to see it go faster, but uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see it in a little bit of perspective and be thankful for how, how it's opened up. We have time for one more question. And, oh, okay, go ahead. Dr. Cox, um, it, this is kind of in the strain of what Yoon asked, but uh, you mentioned this kind of de-Westernization of Christianity and kind of de which would also, I guess, assume the de-Westernization of our theology as well. Um, Western theology often fights to say that our theology is correct. Thus, when we look at some people like Amos Young and his writing on Asian theology, there's a backlash against mm -hmm. kind of his writing and his work there. Um, because it pushes against the culturalization of theology. Can, and is this a possibility, that soteriology be the foundational bedrock within the de-Westernization of theology? However, not a Reformed view, or even Catholic, or even Eastern Orthodox, but a recaptured ecumenical theology of soteriology that is just displayed contextually. Well, I think my short answer to that is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I, but I think one should also remember, you can talk about the de-Westernization of, of Christianity, which I did. You could also call, call it the re-globalization. Yes. Yeah. We, we often forget that Christianity not only grew from Palestine into the Greco-Roman world, it went the other way, too, to Persia, to Ethiopia, to India, to China. When Marco Polo visited China, there were Nestorian Christians there. Uh, and they somehow have been elided from our uh, understanding of, of, the, of the whole global history of Christianity. Now it's becoming global again. And you're, you're right, Murray, there are, different, there, there are rival globalizations, I would put it that way. There, there's the globalization of the big market economy, which is uh, trying to transform everybody into a consumer, has its own religious language, uh, its own values, its own myths. We see them on, on television advertisements and commercials all the time. This is what's wrong with you, and here's how you fix it up. It's got a, it's a, it's all, it's a virtually complete alternate religious system, market consumer capitalism, uh, no doubt about it. But the other movement is world, the globalization of world Christianity, with with Pentecostal movements pretty much in the vanguard of that, but not not doing it entirely. Uh, and these are these are both forms of, of and quite opposite, except where. Certain forms of Christianity, including, alas, certain expressions of, of Pentecostalism, have sold out to the consumer market economy vision of globalization. And we all know, alas, that has happened in some places. Uh, but still, I see it as a counterforce to the, uh, I, I see as a counterforce to the, to, the, to the market God and the market God's sovereignty. Uh, and it's gonna be a tough fight. It's gonna be a tough battle. Okay, look, everybody, thanks a lot for being here, and thanks for having me here. Thank you very much. <laughs>